Welcome to the video on understanding the DiBernardo soccer methodology. I am Marcus DiBernardo and I'm going to walk you through my own personal soccer methodology which is based upon developing soccer intelligence as well as unique skill sets. It focuses on six areas in a methodology. I'm going to walk you through each area, but I am also going to walk you through the science, the reasoning behind each area, and the whole methodology in general, because once you can understand the science behind it, it's going to be easier for you to apply as a coach. As you can see here, the methodology is split into six separate parts that go from game-based trainings, from small, medium, and large area game-based trainings, and then also constraint-based training, supplemental exercises, and positional play. So before we jump into all six areas of the methodology, let's take a step back and let's look at the difference between a high-level player and a lower-level player. And for me, this starts with perception. What do the players see? So one thing we need to understand is that you can have two players involved in the same exact situation, but their perceptions of the situation can differ greatly. So if you see the two photos here, maybe one player's focus is on the yellow targets, maybe another player's focus is on the pink targets, and maybe another player's focus is they can see both. So the question is, why do players perceive the game differently? And if they do, can we change maybe the lower level player's perception through training? And if we can change that perception, will it change their actions to create more successful outcomes? And I always tell the story about Pirlo, who said he figured out a secret to the game. He says most midfielders look down the field and see a winger or they see a striker. But he doesn't see that. He sees the spaces that he can pass the ball for the winger or the striker to run onto. He doesn't focus on the player themselves. So he says his key to success is the way that he perceives the game, his perception. Now, one of the important things to remember is that top players like Pirlo scan more often. And with more head movement and more scanning, they get a better current picture of what's around them. So they have more information in real time that allows them to make more successful decisions. But their success is due to more than just scanning. But let's take a quick look at what these high level players have in common about the way that they perceive things and why they're able to perceive things in certain ways. So now let's look at some high level players compared to lower level players and why their perception is better than the lower level players. And the first thing that we look at is the high level player can couple together essential game cues, essential information, while disregarding all the non-essential information in game cues. And they do this at extremely fast speeds in their subconscious mind. The conscious mind is far too slow to process information in a game like soccer quick enough. So basically, these high level players have to have a great deal of experience to get to this level where they can process information in their domain, which is the soccer domain, right, on the field at these fast speeds. The lower level player will start to focus on the non-essential cues, which will cause them to process the information too slow, which ends up resulting in giving the ball away, making poor decisions, and so forth. Now, if you look at even the eye scanning patterns of the top players and what they perceive, their eye scanning patterns tend to be much different than the lower level players as well. It's more focused, it's less um, compared to a lower level player whose eye scanning patterns are going to be all over the place compared to a more focused higher level player. But the higher level player still obviously has great scanning, they're taking a full picture of what's going on, but they're disregarding and not focusing on the non-essential uh, information that a lower level player would focus on or get distracted by. 
So now let's kind of put this in context in a sports intelligent perspective. And we're going to use basketball as an example. And we'll say that LeBron James is dribbling down the court and there's 10 players on a basketball court. So LeBron James with the ball knows where all nine other players are on that court in real time. Now, in science, they'll call that a flock, that one that one moment. We'll call that in sports, we'll call it a play. So LeBron James, that's a dynamic, fluid, moving situation, knows where everybody is. Now, he will be able to focus in, say there's a player under the basket who's wide open or barely open, he'll be able to focus in on that one player, be able to throw that pass while at the same time still understanding what that what's happening in that play all nine players around him if that play shuts down if that if that pass shuts down he can refocus very quickly in other areas maybe now the pass is not on so now he has to find an open teammate to to pass the ball to he can refocus very very quickly um now, this is a domain-specific thing. Just because LeBron James is great at this in basketball doesn't mean he's going to be great at this um, outside of his domain. And that's a whole separate conversation we can have. But the reality is that he can pick up. His subconscious mind is putting all these cues together. He has pattern recognition. There's so many things we could talk about here that experience at a high level and, and, and playing in these games does for him and does for athletic intelligence. But my premise is this, that we can increase soccer intelligence using game-based training methods that have real game cues and players will expand their intelligence, their soccer IQ, and also build unique skill sets by doing so. And we're going to talk about that more. Now, it has to be mentioned, though, to really increase your domain-specific sports intelligence, you have to have your technical skill set, you know, dribbling the ball, shooting the ball, whatever that is, your technical skill set, it has to be ingrained in your long-term memory. If your skills aren't automatic, there's no way it's going to free up your brain to start figuring out tactical solutions and to, be, and to perceive situations um, and to perceive ways to, to win and be successful um, because your attention is going to be focused on those technical skill sets and that that can't be the case. So I remember Platini saying that when he really started to excel at the game is when he didn't have to think about the ball anymore and his eyes could come up. And that's really really an important step in huge step in player development and hitting that next level and becoming that elite player. So it's important to understand about my methodology is that this is really from a scientific perspective and everything in this methodology is about a changing the way players per perceive the game while they're operating inside obviously that soccer based uh, game based domain and almost every single thing in this methodology revolves around game realistic decision making and how players perceive the game very very that's the cornerstone that is the foundation of this methodology now if decision making is the foundation of the methodology constraint based training is probably the most valuable tool we have in this methodology because basically what it does is it changes the players perception in their domain which is a game-based training so the game cues are realistic and real to the actual game but what it does constraint-based training takes away player freedoms so a player is forced to adapt in order to become successful in this new environment and the result of that is game intelligence and unique skill sets are developed and if I could explain that in a, maybe a little simpler way, is if a player is, say, left-footed and always solves the problems with his left foot and so forth, 
if you give players absolute freedom, they will continue to perceive the game in the same way and solve the, the problems with the same tools. You need to take away some of those familiar tools so they cannot solve the problems in those same ways. And therefore, it changes the player's perception. There's hundreds and hundreds of ways, thousands of ways to use constraints and change perceptions. That's a very skillful thing to do on the coach's part. And that would take me 10 other videos to go over all the different ways we can do that. And that could be done on a team basis and individual basis. But again, another cornerstone of this methodology is changing players' perception, forcing them to adapt and forcing them to create and find new solutions while their freedoms are taken away from them. And ultimately, that will increase their skill sets and their soccer intelligence. So let's go over the methodology really quickly. The first part is small area possession and game-based trainings. Kind of non-directional. There could be goals. There, there might not be goals. It, this is small area, maybe 8 yards by 15 yards. Again, none of this is set in stone. You could feel free to adapt and, and change things up. But you could see that these decisions have to be made in a very, very small area. Next is medium-based uh, possession games. And medium-based start to become a little bit more positional. They start to have goals. You could see here in this game... There's actually two goals, so it is directional, um, but the, there's no goalkeepers. The, 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 the blue players are, are just neutrals, and this is over a bigger space that you can see. All of, A lot of decision-making. Once we get into the larger area possession and game-based trainings, now this is, this is more game model sp specific. Most of them go to goal. Most of them real goals and goalkeepers, and obviously the workload in these games is much higher. The next is the constraint-based training, part four in the methodology, which we went over, which is huge. And this could be done by individual. It could be done in exercises. Here we, we, we have basically an attacking organization model where players are constrained to certain lanes, right? And what, what happens is the constraints end up teaching the players proper attacking organization structure. This is just, again, constraints can do so many things. That is just one idea of a constraint. And then we have supplemental exercises, which are not really based on decision-making. These are, these are things where we work on technical things. This is passing patterns and, and finishing exercises and, and various speed, agility, and quickness. So these are supplemental things that you would do outside of the regular methodology that fit in. The last area here is positional play, and positional play ideas can be worked into our small, medium, and large area um, game-based training in the methodology areas 1, 2, and 3. Now, this is my team actually carrying out uh, our game model, and the, the important thing to understand is that our game model is very flexible, so it's not rigid, so players individually, they, they have individual decisions that they can make. They operate under a general framework, and everybody understands what that framework is, and that our methodology is geared around teaching the game in this way. So my methodology is always changing. It's a dynamic methodology in constant development. Some of the things that I'm working on in the future right now is building neuroplasticity in the toes and the feet to increase skill acquisition. Because as humans, we're programmed, our, our, our neuroplasticity, our programming is made for our hands. We're, supposed, we're very nimble, very coordinated, very skillful with our hands. But our feet is, are not programmed through nature to be that skillful. So are there exercises even outside of the soccer realm that will improve performance on the field because we've developed that neuroplasticity in our feet? Next thing is taking advantage of place cells, head directional cells, and grid cells to increase soccer intelligence and obviously to, to increase performance on the field. These, these, these things are, are very doable um, if you set up your field in the right way. Number three, training with players with different skill sets 
so your mirror neurons can imitate them. You can learn. Basically, if you take like a high-level Brazilian kid at 15 years old and maybe you put him in the Sunderland Academy in England, he's going to have a different skill set, probably a technical skill set and also a tactically thinking skill set than the players at Sunderland. It's a different culture, right? So the players at Sunderland would be able to learn by playing with that player, and some of that learning is due to the mirror neurons. I think that's actually a really, really important thing to look at. And the fourth thing is rethinking the way that we actually train. And don't think of it as you have to train with your team in, in, in the normal understood ways. Why can't we pull two, three players out of that training and they need this specific skill set in this game-based trainings? Let's do that on a weekly basis. Hopefully that video shed a little light on how to navigate my YouTube page for, for looking at all the different parts of the methodology. And also, obviously, hopefully it helped you understand um, what the methodology is kind of based upon. There's my email address if you have any questions. I always look at consulting projects, so if you have anything um, that you want to email me, I'm always happy to look at it. So again, hope you enjoyed the video. Take care.